All right, welcome back everybody. It is Thursday the 24th and we have Damian Leonard in his home office. I am um, at, at home with my kids this afternoon, so. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so Damian, and thank you for being ready. Do you have a, uh, so we, I tried to, I think the question to Ron to ask you was, do you have a, a draft of 329 that we can work with today that incorporates I, what we were discussing? Yep, I do. I can uh, post it as soon as Ron makes me a co-host. I'll put it up on the screen and take you through the changes. Should be posted to the website as well. Uh, yes, and both documents are posted. Great. So and I just sent Ron literally um, moments ago, uh, side by side by side of the existing law, H329 has introduced, uh, and H329 has currently proposed for amendment. <clears throat> All right, I will pull up the amendment now. And Yep. And then if you'll just bear with me during the presentation, uh, I will try to stick with you, but just in case I have, have my two kids in the next room and I may need to step away for a moment. Um, so, okay. Uh, so with the amendment draft that's up on your screen now, uh, the changes in section one are limited to the end of the section. So we're going down to page three, uh, lines 10 or line 10, where severe and pervasive has been changed to severe or pervasive. Moving on to section two, this is the definition of sexual harassment. This is a change that wasn't in the original bill, but it's something that was highlighted in the proposed document from the stakeholders uh, that the committee asked me to base the initial amendment draft on. Uh, and so we've added the words written, auditory, or visual um, to verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. So. Uh, we're covering a broader array of conduct to recognize that uh, sexual harassment is not just unwanted touching or inappropriate comments. It can, can take other forms as well. Uh, the next change on page four, again, this is from the proposed amendments from the stakeholders, would be to uh, and this is going to the definition of sexual harassment here. So striking the word substantially before interfering uh, with an individual's work and instead of work performance. Uh, so the, the old language is substantially interfering with an individual's work performance. The new language is interfering with an individual's work. And then again on line seven, changing the word and between severe uh, and pervasive to or, so it's now severe or pervasive. On line 10, the first change here is uh, my cleanup. This, uh, so originally the definition had been harassment. Uh, and so now to be consistent with the way we're using the term throughout the bill, it's Harass means to engage in unwelcome conduct based on a protected category. Uh, and then, so it's unwelcome conduct that interferes with the employee's work. Uh, I believe this prior draft was substantially interferes with the employee's work performance. Uh, and then, the, so again, that's the same proposed change as we've looked at above with sexual harassment. Uh, and then below here, this is all new language based on the proposal from the stakeholders. 
uh, line starting on line 14, in determining the conduct that constitutes harassment, determination shall be made on the basis of the record as a whole, according to the totality of the circumstances. A single incident may constitute unlawful harassment. So that's identical to the language they proposed. Uh, incidents that may be harassment shall be considered in the aggregate with varying types of conduct and conduct based on multiple characteristics viewed in totality rather than isolation. So I condensed their language here and got rid of the uh, examples which were primarily focused on sexual harassment to uh, reflect the fact that this is a general discrimination statute. Uh, and then C here is the list of instances when conduct may constitute harassment regardless of the following. So whether the complaining individual is the individual being harassed, whether the complaining individual acquiesced or otherwise submitted to or participated in the conduct, whether the conduct is also experienced by others outside of the protected class involved in the conduct, whether the complaining employee was able to continue carrying out the employee's job duties and responsibilities despite the conduct, whether the conduct resulted in a physical or psychological injury, or whether the conduct occurred outside the workplace. So in that list, I made some minor changes for uh, consistency and style uh, related to our statute. Um, but otherwise, the, the substantive intent of the stakeholders' language uh, remains. Are there questions on that before I go on, or would you like me to just push on, Mr. Chair? Uh, Representative Triano. I have I've struggled some with this severe and or per pervasive since that attorney testified um, a week or so ago. So this sentence goes into the negative, need not be... And I'm thinking if it if it's severe and pervasive, then it need not be both. And is that where we're trying to get with this? Um, I'm I'm just still puzzled by this language. <laughs> so, okay, so the current standard is that in order to be uh, to constitute hostile work environment harassment or discrimination, the conduct either needs to be sufficiently severe or sufficiently pervasive in order to create that hostile work environment. The proposal here is to say that it need not be severe or pervasive. It can just be discriminatory or sexually harassing conduct in order to be unlawful. So what it's saying is that a single instance of discrimination, even if it is not uh, exceptionally severe, uh, would, would constitute unlawful discrimination or harassment. So that's the... Got it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, oh. Damien. I just I cleared it up. Okay. Representative, okay. Parsons. Representative Parsons, I believe. No, you're all set. Representative Bloomley, then let's see. I was just going to say that the rationale for that being that courts have really you uh, that's in the eye of the beholder and this piece of legislation is <clears throat> as described by um, Carrie Brown and Bor Yang is to really clarify for the courts um, kind of how to understand how, how to look at harassment because severe um, the words severe and <clears throat> pervasive themselves have been construed to being all kinds of things um, over a period of time. And <clears throat> that this sets the bar severe, pervasive sets the bar too high. <clears throat> I was um, <clears throat> glad to let Representative Lily finish that thought because mine goes a little bit further. And actually what you interjected really cements home for me that I have concerns about um, section 2C Roman numeral VI the conduct occurred outside of the workplace. I, I truly think we're, um, with good reason, making it clear what harassments are that have been allowed to occur 
and potentially this would exclude some, but I just think this is really overreach to be going outside the workplace and include it when it's actionable. So, so just, just to be clear, there are instances under current case law when individual, uh, you can find discrimination that occurs outside of the physical workplace and it, it's a violation of the employment discrimination laws. So um, I, I, I just want to be clear that this is not, uh, so this language is saying that uh, it may constitute harassment regardless of whether it occurred outside of the workplace. Um, and this is consistent with some existing law. There's always discussion over whether it's work-related conduct, whether that conduct is attributable to the defendant uh, or whether the defendant can be held liable for it. Uh, whether this language is appropriate, I can't, can't say, but I did just wanna say that we wouldn't be necessarily extending the law. Although anytime you write something in statute, you may be indicating to the, the court that it's your, the sense of the legislature uh, that the law needs to be clarified and, and maybe those parameters about how you look at conduct outside the workplace need to be uh, set somewhat differently. So the rule of construction is that the, uh, the legislature um, you know, every change that you make to the statute has a purpose, whether you're deleting words or adding words, and you wouldn't just add words that are meaningless. So um, courts would, of course, ask what the meaning is and what the intent is. So um, I, I just do find it causes me discomfort because there aren't parameters around it. And I think that we've made some real <clears throat> loosenings of parameters in other areas. And so to reinforce one that, in my mind, really needs parameters, I, I, I'm just not comfortable with it and I want to put it on the table. I mentioned it before and it's, mm -hmm. I just wanted to keep it active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Representative Parsons and then I over and then Byron. Yeah, it's Representative Murphy's point. Um, I feel like in the, for me anyway, that part of it certainly is problematic and I don't know if I'm conflating or the, the way we're talking about it is conflating the idea of whether the workplace is conflating with like in the course of your work. I mean, not in the workplace, the the function of your structural work. building or that, or it's in the course of your work, you know, you know, I, I'm just not sure if we're doing that or if we're purposely saying on Saturday when you're not at work and you meet up 50 miles away and you're like, hey, we're at the same restaurant. We're not engaging in a work function. Yeah. That's right, functional work. Capacity. That really looks to me yes. like That's, that counts as harassment as far as work's concerned. Yes. You, you, well, could it? That's, <laughs> well, if they're like out on their own time, they're not working. Like, it could, it, but is yeah. it actionable to the employer? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's still harassment. Of course it's harassment. It. But it's, yes. it's, we're talking about actionable. Yes. I, and just building off that point, yeah, but my question is, you know, like people um, engage outside of work, both like socially, sometimes not, but if they're outside of the managerial umbrella and they, the way I read this, this will open up <clears throat> bad behavior outside of a managerial or supervisory umbrella to be actionable via lawsuit because it just says outside of the workplace. Like, I think it needs to be very specific that it is within a role of like a work-based function or duty. So I think if we didn't include it at all, the fact that everything else speaks to employee, you're speaking about workplace. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so what you're saying is like what that's trying to, what we perceive it's trying to accomplish is only accomplished within the other I Unless see. you're trying to expand beyond when I'm your employee. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, no, I, I, I agree with your point, Representative Murphy. <clears throat> Representative Tron. So, it's, it occurs to me that if you are being harassed in the workplace on a regular basis 
and you finish your work and you're heading out to the parking lot um, with your coworker who continues to harass you, that is outside the workplace. It is not conducting a work function, but it is still harassment. So how would we cover that? How would, what, what do we do about that situation? I mean, I just, and I think that it's likely to, to happen more to likely than going 50 miles down the road. No, no, no but to what you said, on the way out of work, the case exactly. of harassment, that means the harassment began at the door. So exactly. the violation occurred here, when it's not occurred there, it happened here. Well, suppose yeah, so. it happened only in the parking lot. Suppose it didn't happen on a daily basis in the workplace, work right. but on your way out of work, that would be work somebody right. starts calling you names and making references that are that are. Uh, in, in my mind, that's how it's selling the property. Right. Yeah. So if so we eliminate, it, but if we eliminate it, then it's gone, and there's no way to protect against that. It's not. Okay, Representative Pango and Kalaki and Walsh. So I agree with Representative Parson, um, <clears throat> wrong on this, that if it's happening on the grounds of whatever you consider your workplace to be, then yes, that falls under employment. If it happens elsewhere, I don't feel that um, it is part of someone's employment. And I do feel that this... Um, the way this is written broadens it to encompass anywhere. And what I was going to suggest originally is that we hear from Damien what his interpretation of this is, because this really is a legal document. Lucky <coughs> um, <coughs> Walls at Howard. <coughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to the punchline of that after we <laughs> not the punchline. I'm sorry, that's not the right word. But <laughs> We'll get Damien's comment on that. <laughs> There's been many stories we've heard um, with women talking about, um, with like, like a Harvey Weinstein being asked to go to a hotel and meet him for meetings, for professional meetings. They weren't professional meetings, they were harassed. That was off site. We, we've heard uh, it's a case for the City Council of Burlington where. Uh, two people, one of the counselors and so, someone else was off-site and uh, the woman felt she was um, coerced into having a relationship. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, I'm thinking of this now, Joe, from what you were talking about, because I'm thinking if we ran into your supervisor at a restaurant on a Sunday afternoon and then suddenly you feel like you're kind of stuck in a corner there with your supervisor and um, forced into something. I think that that there it does. That's how I read this part. That is that that that's the kind of harassment that I see in in that. So um, Representative Walls and Howard, can I respond to that point very briefly? Sure. The, the point that you made where it was like a need to be requested outside of work, in my mind, links that to work. So if someone who is in a, a, a position of power or authority is like, I want to meet you outside of work and purpose of work, and then does something nefarious, in my mind, that is a bridge to these other harassment positions because it was a meeting that was requested under the guise of your work duties. Oh, okay. <laughs> Representative Walsh. Well, I, I'm in favor of the more expansive interpretation of this because I can see the harassment very easily happening through email, through phone calls, at home, wherever the person is, and it could have a direct impact on their work conditions, even though that's not happening at work. So uh, I, I'm not in favor of saying it has to be narrowly defined to happening at the workplace. Representative Howard. Thank you. Um, I'm <clears throat> going to sound repetitive to uh, what Rep Representative Walsh yeah. just said. Um, yeah, my concern would be if it's an offsite um, training, for example, um, the harassment takes place there. Um, I, I feel that you know it it should be ex extended to not just in the workplace in the building. Thank you. And so uh, I guess my, for, uh, 
the best we can in. Should I miss you? No. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the example I would ask, put on the table is, is if I go to, if I travel from my house, I'm not at work, it's a weekend day and I run, I go to Home Depot and I see a coworker and I make comments that are perceived to be harassing. I can make comments about tools. I can make comments about hammers. I can make comments about whatever. <laughs> and then, and then we go back to work on Monday. Yeah. And I make tool and make comments about tools and hammers that work that have innuendo. Is that offsite? Was that offsite harassment? Am I using that that interaction that happened offsite, that happenstance, that happened offsite, to then turn it around in my position of being a harasser to to continue the harassment of somebody? But it started offsite. But to your point, it then continued onsite, which makes it a violation under the current. Right, but it started offsite as a sort of happenstance. It just sort of happened in passing. Is that it had nothing to do with work except for there was a relationship between those two people, a work relationship to those people. So I, it's, 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 yeah, no, no, no. no but, but my point is, is like that the the scenario you're describing is like it, it, the initial engagement of you know inappropriate contact happening outside of work occurs outside of work, but then it rolls into a continued conversation in work. So thereby the violation, as far as um, workplace liability, still occurs. It just happens in the second instance. Okay. Um, Representative Hango, then Damien. I was just going to comment that, um, first of all, I think we're narrowing or we're broadening this so much that it doesn't have to be multiple incidences. It could just be the incident that's happening at work. And also, um, where was I going with that? The fact that it is off premises and there were whatever comments I wasn't following that um, that would not that if it caused a negative interaction would that not come up as discrimination in some other place of public accommodation because it happened at a store I don't know I just feel that this is so broad we're all going to be afraid to go anywhere and say anything to anybody so Damien is, Damien is <laughs> waving <laughs> I, we were we've is gone off. Ask us to take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, I, I. Everybody can, if you can, just pause for a second, okay? First, public accommodations harassment involves the place of public accommodations harassing or public accommodations discrimination wow. involves the place of public accommodations discriminating against an individual. Not one individual in that place of public accommodations who has no affiliation discriminating against another individual in that place of public accommodations. So that that's outside the law. <laughs> there, with the workplace harassment, it is existing and current law that discrimination and sexual harassment can be unlawful under employment discrimination statutes, whether it occurs on or off premises. And this is very, very important for the committee to understand. This is existing law. It can occur on or off premises. So to quote from the EEOC, uh, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission at the federal level, they enforce the federal discrimination law. And their FAQs, the question is, does harassment have to occur at work for it to be illegal? Answer, no. Federal law protects you from job discrimination and harassment, whether it occurs on or off the work site. For example, you may have a potential claim for sexual harassment if your manager pressures you for dates while at a work-related conference. Likewise, uh, on their more general page re regarding harassment, they say harassment can take many forms. 
It can involve verbal, physical, or visual conduct. It can occur on or off the work site. The harasser can be your manager, a manager in another area, a coworker, others in your workplace, including clients or customers. However, for an appropriate behavior to rise to the level of illegal harassment, it must be unwelcome or unwanted. And then they get into the severe or pervasive standard, which is in the current law. Um, inappropriate behavior is also illegal if it results in your employer <laughs> making an employment decision about you, such as refusing to promote you or demoting you. So an example of offsite illegal discrimination that could occur here and going in the sexual harassment uh, realm would be you see your manager at the bar, your manager uh, makes an advance to you or asks you on a date that's off the off site. You get back to work after saying no there and you're demoted or you're assigned to a bad shift. This looks like retaliation for turning down your manager. This is actionable sexual harassment potentially. So by the same token, racial discrimination could occur if your manager doesn't know you're in a biracial marriage, sees you outside of work with your spouse who happens to be of a different race. You then get demoted or punished because of your association with that individual who has a protected characteristic. In both of these cases, the burden is on the individual making the complaint to show that it's actionable workplace harassment and the employer has the opportunity to show that no, the reason I demoted you is because your performance has been terrible for the last six months or some other legitimate workplace reason. The reason I put you on that shift is because we were short of people and you're the junior person and under our union agreement, you're the one who gets reassigned a shift first. So there are a number of legitimate reasons here, but there are instances where something that occurs out of work can become part of a workplace harassment or discrimination claim. And this is existing law. This would not be changed by the bill. What I was noting earlier is that when we spell things out in the law, the court does sometimes take this as, is the legislature telling us that we need to do something differently than what we've already been doing? Or are they just restating the existing law? What California has done on these issues is they've cited cases that they agree with and they're saying we're reiterating this and telling courts to follow this decision because we agree with it. That's one way to say we're not changing the law, we're following precedent and we want you to look to this precedent for guidance going forward. Uh, so I just wanted to be clear about that though because this is it's important to know that we wouldn't on its face be changing the law. There is a question of, is the judiciary going to say, is this going to, you know, this should change our interpretation in some way. I can't predict that, but that's probably the policy consideration for you as you're deciding whether to include this language uh, going forward. So, but that, that's all I wanted to clarify is it's, it's important to understand that there are instances when you get into these instances though too, it has to be able to be tied to the workplace and for the employer to be liable, you have to be able to show that they were aware of it and did nothing to stop it or they allowed that hostile work environment to grow and exist at work. And that, that's where the, uh, some of the defenses that we've talked about come in where the employer has a program designed to prevent it and takes reasonable steps to prevent that um, from going forward. So, you know, for example, you could come to your supervisor after an incident like that and say, hey, this happened and now I'm being ostracized at work because of what happened off site. And then your supervisor could step in and take appropriate steps to uh, keep that from turning into a hostile work environment or stop the hostile work environment before it goes further. That's how employers avoid liability under the law is they find out that something is going wrong and they take steps to stop it or they prevent supervisors who, uh, where employers are liable for a supervisor's actions if they're 
uh, they prevent supervisors from from doing something wrong in the first place um, through training, et cetera. So with that, I'll just let the conversation continue. <laughs> I just would again say that we aren't dealing with, is, with what is currently in the law if we leave this in because we're changing the current law to say that severe or pervasive is not required. So we, we are changing parameters that otherwise give a level of security protection for those of us that are a little concerned about how much this could, no offense intended, my son-in-law is a lawyer, but how much this could just pay some folks a little bit of money to do some actions. Um, and so I, I just think that in my mind with what we're doing to try to really anchor down <coughs> that harassment doesn't have to be the severity of what people have really had to prove to, to the point of injuries. Um, we're lightening things up and I don't feel comfortable leaving this line in. That <laughs> Representative Pango. Thank you, Damien, for clarifying the federal law because I was not clear on that. And now it kind of has me wondering where H329 is going. Um, you mentioned having um, the internal grievance process be part of the proof that the employer did nothing to stop the harassment or discrimination if an employee <clears throat> has made a complaint through the internal grievance process and it's gone nowhere. So by removing the internal grievance process, what are we now doing? to this. I'm really concerned about that section now. So um, the internal grievance process is part of uh, one of the affirmative defenses that an employer can assert. Uh, and the key, the key in that is first that you have taken reasonable steps to prevent um, the discrimination or harassment from occurring. The second is that the employee unreasonably failed to take advantage of the internal procedures. So um, there are instances where there, it could be reasonable. For example, your harasser is the person you have to report the harassment to and there's no alternative. Um, and, uh, or uh, you know, an, another potential instance when it could be reasonable is if the other people who have reported harassment have all been retaliated against um, publicly by the, the company. So it's, you know, the perception <laughs> is that if you call the anonymous helpline uh, and report the harassment three days later, you're fired. Then that might be an instance when an employee could argue it was reasonable. But generally, if you have a, a good program set up, the employee is going to need to show uh, or the employer can can argue that the and show that the employee was unreasonable in failing to take advantage of that process and insulate themselves or reduce their potential liability in that case. Um, so there are there are some instances when you can't apply that, such as when a supervisor takes a tangible employment action as part of the harassment or discrimination, whether that's demotion, withholding a pay raise, bad assignment, et cetera. Um, but the, the, that defense is there. I think uh, you've heard from advocates on their concerns about removing that law, uh, that language, or, or taking away that ability to assert that or consider that. So it really comes down to a policy um, question of whether you think it's appropriate uh, to keep that uh, defense or to reduce it or limit it. Um, and I, I can't really speak to that, but that is one possible defense that an employer can assert. The other, I mean, the, the basic way these cases go if you don't assert that defense uh, is, as you'll remember, Karen Stackpole talking about the McDonnell Douglas, which is basically just the, the order that you prove your case. So the employee 
shows that there's a, on its face, they were discriminated against, then the employer has to show that it, there was actually a legitimate reason why they took their action. Um, like I mentioned before, performance or something like that. And if the employer shows that, then the burden shifts back to the employee to show that that was just a pretext for the discrimination. So the, at each stage, one or the other party has a burden of proof. So without the, with the, the language related to the Farragher Ellerth defense, which is that language about uh, failure to take advantage of the internal grievance process, you're removing just one one of the ways that an employer can insulate themselves from liability or uh, affirmatively defend themselves against a lawsuit. So, but again, I, I would defer to the advocates who've spoken on that issue as to, you know, um, whether or not that's the appropriate change to make in the law. And I, I think you've heard a lot of testimony on both sides. So, Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll go back to our previous um, what we were talking about. Um, the what you explained is how it's currently dealt with seems perfectly reasonable to me because everything had at least a link to work. A conference, you only have to conference because of work. Um, get being turned down by a supervisor outside of work, and then there's something actual in the workplace. Um, and I feel like that one little site, that one little line there just says, you know, there, there doesn't have to be anything actual at the work, workplace, doesn't have to be anything, anything. So my suggestion would be, I, it sounds good the way it's dealt with now, and I think we should remove that one. Is that a question? Um, but I realize we haven't gotten through the whole bill yet. And so, um, <laughs> So I like this conversation. And uh, um, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm understanding, Damien, what you said, if we remove that one line, it wouldn't change current obligations and statutes. No, if you, no. If you remove that line, right. uh, you would still be able to make the case that conduct that occurred outside of work was part of a... <laughs> a pattern or, uh, you know, the was part of creating the hostile work environment or is the reason for the sort of quid pro quo adverse employment action that occurs, um, which is, you know, the, uh, that individual turned me down. So now I'm going to demote them or now I'm going to refuse them the promotion. Um, that is sort of the, the common uh, image of of sexual harassment from uh, from years ago, uh, before we started talking as much as we are about hostile work environment. Um, okay, thank you, Tim. Um, yep. So I, I think that's a factor for us to look at when we land on that one. The other one, I I think uh, what Representative Hango talked about about the um, not pursuing an internal grievance. My thought is just to be silent on that. And, and not to have that in this bill. And um, because, Damien, I, I, I think you said already it's not a determinative factor if they pursued one or not pursued one. It, it can be uh, if you can show that they were unreasonable in not pursuing that internal grievance. Okay. So that's because the, yeah. if you think about it this way, um, the employer's argument is because the individual didn't pursue their internal grievance, I had no idea this behavior was going on, so I couldn't stop the behavior, so how can I be held liable? Uh, and that, that applies when you're talking about someone who's not a supervisor. So that's when you can assert this defense is so is one coworker harassing another coworker. Neither one was in a supervisory role, uh, the employer uh, is going to assert, in that case, if the individual didn't pursue the internal grievance, the, they'll say, we have a robust prevention program, uh, and the individual didn't take advantage of it, 
So we had no idea this was happening and couldn't prevent it. Um, the, so that would continue to be a defense available to employers if you take the language out of the bill. If you leave it in, uh, I think that defense is, uh, I'm not sure how you would assert that defense anymore uh, going forward. Uh, and I'm not sure what, what the courts would do with that, except saying that we're being told by the law that we, can't, can, we shouldn't consider whether an individual uh, pursued an internal grievance. Okay, well, the, the, those are my two things that when we come to looking at consensus on different aspects. Okay, but could, could we finish going through the bill? Uh, we have 12 or 13 minutes, sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me right back to that. Three. We're on page one. <laughs> Not quite that bad. Um, <laughs> more text pulled us back. Four. Okay. So we're uh, we're actually now in the section three. Um, and the rest of this should go quickly because we're discussing sort of the, the big pieces. Um, the first change here on page six, line two, I just noticed I've forgot to capitalize uh, the reference to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the next change here is, uh, oh, so this is, uh, what we're doing here is we're amending this language to get rid of the substantially interferes with. Um, and I think I highlighted it just because it's part of this phrase that tracks from undermines or interferes with in this draft, the underlying bill said or substantially interferes with the person's terms, conditions, privileges, et cetera. And this is with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling or other real estate or services or facilities can, in connection with that. Um, the change on line two of page seven is to change severe and pervasive to severe or pervasive. And then again, on lines beginning on line three, uh, it's the same list uh, to consider with respect to harassment uh, as with employment discrimination. So uh, if you were to take out the um, the, the change here is that the conduct occurred outside of the place of public accommodations, public accommodation, it should be singular or dwelling. Um, so again, if you took out that language, uh, in the employment instance, you may want to consider removing it here. Uh, likewise, if you keep it, you may want to keep it here for consistency, but the Otherwise, these are the exact same as the provisions we discussed earlier, just referring to housing uh, and public accommodations. And section five gets us into the education law. So, uh, Damon, can you scroll just back down a little bit there? Is that, is that it, at the 26A, is that, do you need to change that to Harris? Or is that, no, no, you're right yeah, back where you were. Right. Oh, yeah, you mean this right here? No, 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 no. beginning of the education center, uh, section. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, the very start. No, yeah. I'm gonna leave, leave this because that's the underlying definition. Um, so. And for, and, for committee, and for committee's information, I shared the section, Section five with the chair of the education committee to see, um, just they shared it with her to uh, to read and see how it would affect her world. And if we need to take testimony from um, agency of education or anybody else. Yeah, school boards chat. association would be another one uh, potentially impacted um, if they have concerns. The, uh, yeah, so it's the same changes here. Um, the, 
so the the way this impacts the agency of education and school boards is the agency of education puts out a model harassment policy which is why we're keeping the word harassment um, and then school boards adopt policies for dealing with student misconduct including harassment which is again why we're keeping the word harassment at the start um, so this would take out the substantially undermining or detracting from or interfering. And instead of the student's educational performance, the student's education. Um, so with the, again, the focus that the stakeholders uh, are proposing here is that does this undermine, detract from, or interfere with the student's education in general? not whether they're able to uh, perform highly in the educational environment. Um, so Damien, I know from experience that the model policies are often adopted by school districts who don't want to, for whatever reason, write their own policy that's different from the model policy. Um, so would individual school districts then have to go back in and vote on these changes when they come down to them through the, the SBA? So that is a, that's a good question. Um, I'm, and this is getting outside of my area of expertise. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how school, school boards adopt these policies if they adopt the model policy. I imagine they would have to review the changes and approve them. Um, and one of the questions that I just don't know the answer to is, would these changes require AOE to modify its model policy? Um, and so I, that's, I think, part of why the chair has sent this over to the chair of the Education Committee to see if, if testimony needs to be taken on this. Uh, okay, it, it, it. Sorry. Yeah. That makes sense, um, just because I know from experience that I sit on a policy committee and, and periodically we go through all of the policies and if there are any changes, we have to bring them to all the individual schools to vote on, um, the board has to vote on them. Um, it's, it's a long process. So just by changing this in Vermont statute may not change this um, for quite some time within school districts. I just have a question, Damien. I'm, I am assuming that um, that the, the bill um, written as it is to include public accommodations and education um, settings is that harassment discrimination law should be consistent across <clears throat> areas of law, right? So that, that they're um, and that that's why the language is inserted in here. It's, um, and, the, and, and does this typically happen when <clears throat> there are changes made to um, discrimination law? Uh, so <clears throat> to answer your first question, yes, my understanding of the, uh, of the sponsor's goal was to make this consistent uh, across the board. Um, the, uh, in my experience, this is somewhat unusual. Uh, I typically, the bills that I deal with on discrimination are, uh, they're employment focused. They may incorporate public accommodations. This is the first time I've gotten into title 16 in one of my bills. Um, the, I do have other bills though. Um, that you know uh, run a much wider um, uh, across a much wider range of law in terms of discrimination. The the best example is the genetic discrimination, the earlier version of the genetic discrimination bill that's currently being considered in Senate Finance in five minutes. Um, not that I'm on a timeline, but yes, I do need to go in five minutes. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the earlier version of that bill uh, went into public accommodations, employment, and uh, insurance, where it's the, the new version of that bill is, is focused entirely on insurance. Um, so, 
uh, there are some bills that that run across this gambit, but typically the bills are more focused on a specific issue such as employment and labor law or public accommodations and housing. Uh, so uh, it this would be, I think, one of maybe three bills that I've done over over my eight years here that's that's gone across uh, um, employment, education, and public accommodations and housing for discrimination. Do you have a quick question? It, it's something that Damien doesn't necessarily need to be there to give us opinion on, but it could be quick. I just have another piece that I was trying not to drop so he could finish the bill. Right. It's on uh, page six, line seven, small d. The, the language, notwithstanding any state or federal judicial precedent to the contrary, the provision shall be construed liberally to accomplish remedial purposes. Any exceptions and exemptions shall be construed narrowly. So again, <clears throat> to maximize the deterrence of discriminatory behavior. So I think, again, there are things we're changing. There are intent to really tighten up how harassment and discrimination occur. And I just think we kind of breezed over that section. So the only I reason I, I sorry yeah the only reason I skipped it today is because that uh, doesn't have any proposed changes in it. Um, but it's part so, of the bill. We are changing statute. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, yes, but not in. It's not changed from the underlying bill in this amendment, is what I meant. But that is Correct. a proposed addition to the law, which is uh, is a is a construction clause that we'd be at, adding to the law. There. Right. So yes, you're you yeah, are correct. And just, yeah, and for the for the kind of edification that as we move these drafts, just because we go to a new draft doesn't mean that everything hasn't been diagnosed and, and no, agreed upon right. in the first draft. So that's why I just you know it, it would get lost and it would be presumed I wasn't having issue if I hadn't brought it forward. So sure. Okay. Um, Representative Bloomley then Kalaki, and then I just have one for Daniel. Well, it is. Um, Damien, I, if I'm remembering correctly, you said um, that this was very standard language, right? That is used in um, uh, similar types of it, legislation. I think the better word is it's it's common language. Um, so it's it appears in several dozen places in the Vermont statutes annotated. Um, I, I don't have an exact count because uh, of the way the search engine works with the statute. It sometimes pulls up uh, cases rather than statutes. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are dozens of instances of language like that in the Vermont statutes. Um, but this, it is each time you put it in, like I, I mentioned before, um, you know, the court will look at that and say, okay, we've been told to construe this liberally to prevent discrimination. Does that change the way we look at this case? Uh, so uh, I think that's all I can add on that. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I, I think another section we need more conversation on is, and. and I think you are not the summary judgment part. I mean, not now, but when we go back to it, I would like to which part. Yeah, I didn't hear that. What part? Summary, summary, judgment. summary judgment. All right. So I got to yes, go ahead, Damien. Go ahead. Um, Damien, can get, for our next, we're not going to take this up till we get back because we're not going to take this up tomorrow. Um, so, so committee, what I've heard over the last couple of days. That summary judgment is a is a question. So if you could put brackets around that session, I'd like to I'd like the next um, draft again. Hearing what I've heard, that the um, internal review or whatever that section is, I'd like to put brackets around that. As a questionable piece of piece to, to determine same thing brackets around um, <laughs> replace the what is it bi the little bi section three i believe and then brackets around the education section in total till we find out from 
And and I and again, I want to make clear to the committee when I ask for brackets, it's not. I don't want to say prepared draft that deletes all those things, but I think that those are the sections that I've heard are yeah. most problematic in the bill right now, and they're still there for conversation. I'm inviting people back in on Monday. The eighth, right? Tuesday, right? No, it's my Monday, but yeah, yes, <laughs> a legislative Monday, right? Uh, right. So yeah, Tuesday, to it. So Damien, if you could just do that and prepare that, and because um, that's something that I want to, if you could let me know when that's ready, then I can share that with the prospective witnesses. I, so I will. Get... Yeah, I'll try I'll to share with that. the whole. <laughs> Sorry. Can, can I just confirm my list with you? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the things to bracket are the liberal construction language, the appropriateness for summary judgment language, the language relating to conduct outside of the workplace, and the section relating to the education law. Did I miss anything? Yes. Summary judgment, did you say that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> internal <laughs> grievance. Outside the workplace. Oh, the internal the grievance, thank you. The repetition of it. And if we're bracketing all of education, then you don't, I mean, maybe within education that sh should still be bracketed, but I don't know. I'll leave that to you. Yep. What, what I'll do is I'll put notes in a, a different color next to anything that is uh, needs additional committee discussion. Um, or, you know, I'll, I'll say like flagged for additional committee discussion. Uh, and then I'll resend the draft um, whenever I get a chance to do this, understanding that uh, I've got a lot of work to do on H96. Um, so uh, I, I will try to get this back to the committee by tomorrow so that uh, people can be reading it over the break. Thank you, Damien. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.